<laughs> Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Across the Broken Stars, and I'm joined by my co-host, starting with Rob J. Hayes. That's me. Uh, I'm Rob J. Hayes, author of whatever book this one is. It is my science fiction one, Drones. Yay! Michael R. Fletcher. Greetings. I am Michael R. Fletcher, author of all those books back there behind me that I am too lazy to actually reach for. <laughs> and Dirk Ashton. And I wrote these things. The Paternus Trilogy. Nice. And today we're going to be doing a listener questions episode. Um, we've got a couple of awesome questions from our patrons. So we're going to go through them now. Uh, the first one we'll kick off with comes from John, who asks, if any of you were to attempt to write a very large scale series like Stormlight, Wheel of Time, A Song of Ice and Fire, etc., how would you go about this? Would your process be any different from usual? What's the lo- Who's ri- Who here has written the longest series? I think Rob. How many? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm halfway through writing a really long series. Uh, go and haven't started again yet. So, are, but, um, are, are any of them out yet? Yeah, it's uh, it's my first Earth uh, saga. So, oh, okay. my, my debut uh, trilogy, The Ties That Bind, um, yeah. a trilogy. And then there was the Best Laid Plans duology. Uh, and then there was City of Kings, um, which was a standalone, but they're all part of the First Earth saga. Um, okay. So six books, okay. and there's another six books coming at some point when I can find time to read them. So that's the way I went about it. I wrote them, I, I broke it up into uh, into individual series or standalones um, so that I would be able to write them, A, over time, and B, you know, not, not just be like, hey, here, here's a... 12 book series but like okay here's a trilogy and then if you want you can now jump in at this duology and then if you want you can just start on this standalone or you know different different kicking off points within within the series as well i'm actually i'm absolutely mortified by the idea of writing a uh, anything longer than a trilogy or maybe four books i just you know the like the malazans and the stormlights and the and the uh, the the wheel of time kind of thing. I just I don't think I honestly don't think I could do it. Um, it's basically just side quest after side quest, right? Um, then something even bigger and more powerful showed up, yeah. and then something yeah, but, even I mean, bigger but, and but, more powerful is like yeah, okay, people that, people that love it and people that are, that are good at writing them do them really well. Except any uh, just about anybody who's read the big the really long series always says there are at least two or three stinkers in there um, that were either really too slow or, or just seemed like filler or something like that. And I, I, that's, I would be afraid that I'd write the first book and it'd be pretty good. And it would all be filler after that. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't, my brain doesn't work that way. I have a huge amount of respect for people who can, can do that. And a lot of, a lot of my friends, right really long series and each of their books is like 200 300 or more thousand words and i just i don't think that my brain could do it the only way i think i could do it and i would like to write a four to six book series but it would be more like um harry dresden right it would be more like episodic shorter straight kind of urban fantasy um mission of the day kind of Kind of, of with with an over yeah with an overland with with an overarching theme, but I think that's the only way I could I could write a long a longer series the the truly epic fantasy ones I don't think I could do it Mike from an indie perspective, I mean you think about say ten books mm-hmm. you're into book three mm-hmm. you realize book one it's not selling that well and you're like oh well, shit and you just stop and you just stop but now you've got a small group of fans. Mm-hmm. Who are like you said this was going to be a ten book series, and who are livid at you? And yeah, will email you fairly regularly, Petros. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we love Petros. Mike, can you just put your <laughs> microphone a bit closer? You sound a bit faint. I sound faint. That's here I can turn myself up here. Yeah, that'd be good. The uh, sound of your voice is going to make me faint. So uh, there's the economic side, which uh, scares me away, and also we're, we live in an era where. Um, there's a huge 
portion of the sort of fantasy reading population who are of the opinion that it's best to wait until a series is done before buying it. So like Mm -hmm. you're supposed to like put all that time in on faith that maybe when it's done, people will start buying it. That's it. I mean, when you're looking at, if you're fast, two books a year, that's, that's a shit ton of work for seriously questionable, you know, payback. Hmm. Except so, that you know, from a business point of view, standalones and trilogies kind of make the most amount of sense, which is probably a different topic and not at all what he asked. Yeah. But um, no, that's sorry. no, that's definitely no, that's, relevant. That's valid. I mean, but I um, but we know people who write seven, ten, twelve book or longer series who have made a fortune. Basically, well, I was just going to bring and, up Will you know Black a lot of people actually who have done that. I mean, I can name uh, David Estes's Fate Mark series, which he's now continuing with Kingfall. Um, Phil uh, Tucker's Path of uh, Path of Flames, um, uh, and um, AC Cobble's Benjamin Ashwood. Um, these guys have done really, really well yeah, with these I long that's, that's series. Rarity. That is a yeah, that's not, and it, it's sort of like it's got to be a particular kind of epic fantasy, um, and um, but they yeah they just do really well with them, and if their books are not doing that well, um, I know some people who have, have who have done that, who if the books are not doing that well, they just wrap it up in four books. They just they just wrap it up. They finish the series with with one more book, um, and then it then it's done, and they move on to something else. But then when something like that catches, like Will White, you know, who is a superstar, and the Cradle series, I mean, he's they just keep going, and they have today. made they they've made him literally a fortune, um, because they're a series, and those are relatively short books. Um, and uh, so longer series can do extremely well and, you know, set you up for a long time. I Even just don't know like that. Will White, though, he said. Like he's, an he, except, he, he's an exception. But no, even sure. beyond the exception, he was planning for Cradle to be like a trilogy or five books. And then when it started yeah. becoming really successful, he looked yeah. at it and thought, how can I actually expand this story and make it better by doing it over more volumes? Right. So. Yeah. You go back to well, some of our interviews we've done with him in the past, he'll say that. And I think that's a really good approach is to try to write your first mm-hmm. book so that it could work as a standalone. A perfect mm-hmm. example here is the first Star Wars movie, right? Star Wars, A New Hope. It works totally well as a standalone, but it then also leads into a trilogy, which a trilogy then also works totally well as a standalone, but then you can add other trilogies on to the end or before it, which may be a varying degrees mm-hmm. of quality. And I think mm-hmm. that's a good way to think about how to structure your series is like, yeah. can you create an outline for your series that allows you to finish it after one book, that allows you to finish it after two books, after three books, after four books, after five books. And pretty much you could end it at any point if you stop being yeah. satisfied with it or you yeah. know, it doesn't have the sales that you want it to have while also giving you the option of if you're enjoying it and if it's selling well to continue with it to whatever natural point um, you want to take it to. Because I think even, mm. even though, Mike, as you were saying before, like you do want to avoid writing a 10 book series if only 10% of readers are getting through that series. Yeah. There is, particularly within the indie world, like strong economic reasons to have these longer series because things like read through between the books um, can lead to you know more sales for you as an author rather mm. than... 10 disconnected books, um, which readers might have attachment to one of the books, but then not be interested in the others. Um, But then, yeah, it's a bit of a trade-off, right? Where you've got to make sure that you're having enough readers going through each book um, so that by the time that they get into the last book in the series, there are a decent percentage of readers um, still there. Rob, do you want to talk a little bit? I would say, I I think that's a good approach. Think about it in terms of, of trilogy and then, but, keep in your mind that if it's doing really well, you might want to expand it. Um, Or some people will write a standalone 
and mm. and plan on it just being Melinda Spencer or ML Spencer planned on doing that with Dragon Mage. And it was so incredibly successful and still is. Um, and so many people were contacting her wanting more that she is writing um, another book now. And uh, but she had never really planned on doing that, but she also didn't expect it to become that popular. Um, and I think the world does have plenty of potential to expand further. Then there's George R. R. Martin, where obviously, Who? yeah, Never. he planned on he. I mean, those books have no. I mean, when when each book ends, it's not the end of the story, and you know that for a fact. That there's more going happening right now. Um, but he was George Martin, and he was already fairly successful doing what he was doing. So. So, I mean, I, I knew Paternus was going to be a trilogy, so it does just continue one book right after the other. Um, I try to end with some emotional thing, but it's certainly no, nor so, no sort of standalone kind of story, any of the books, really. So, I mean, I think if, if you're wanting to make sort of economical sense about it, a good way to do it is treat it like it's a modular sort of thing where you know you're you're writing either a standalone or a trilogy but with the chance of making it bigger and different different starting on points or whatever so you know it allows it allows you to keep increasing it if it's selling well and if you want to keep writing it or it allows you to end it um but there is the other sort of like factor of just like if you have a story in your head and you think this is going to be a 10 book story then just make it a 10 book story write the, write the story you want to write write the mm. series you write yeah. if you're you not know. worried about if you're not that worried about economics exactly um, or if, if you're the kind worried. of person or if you're the kind of person who can write five books a year which we know people that can do that then in a couple of years you'd have it done and, and you could move on though. they are like, the don't, exception don't ever yeah. think that you like yeah. you, you don't want to sort of start yeah. telling people that they can write five books a year because the majority of us really can't well i'm i'm completely shocked that 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 mike and rob can write two or three books a year i can't do that i'm like a one book a year year and a half guy and that's it <laughs> you've been disarmed by the compliment <laughs> i think um yeah, even within the traditional publishing world, this is something that Gareth Hanrahan, author of The Gutter Prayer and The Shadow Saint, who we have had on the podcast in the past, podcast in the past, um, he's mentioned this as well, like the modular nature of how his book writing works because he wrote, pretty sure he wrote The Gutter Prayer and then that was sort of a standalone. It did really well. So the publisher's like, here, have another one. You write The Shadow Saint, did really well, has another one. The Broken God, I think, is the third one. So... But when you read it, it really does function super well as a series because characters from previous books are coming back into the new ones, um, sometimes in different roles. The world is expanding. There is a sense of progression, but also each book is wonderfully self-contained. So I think this is universal regardless of whether you're going down the indie route versus the traditional publishing route is the need to have it as a modular thing. The other quick thing I will say for this particular question before we do move on um, cause we've got two other ones I'd like to get to is for something of the scale of like stormlight or wheel of time or a song of ice and fire. I would really recommend having some continuity document or, you know, world Bible for yourself. Um, because if you're writing a series at that scale, you're probably going to have a ton and a ton of characters in there. Um, and it's yeah. going to be frustrating when you get to book three and you want to bring back some side character from book one. And you're trying to remember, what was their name? What was their like eye color? <laughs> what were their abilities and everything? Do that in the same book. Yeah, or even in the same book, yeah. right? Um, One chapter. Yeah. So, <laughs> so eye color is an absolute killer. I stuff. could never remember it. I'm just like, yeah, this guy's eye color was, I don't know, pink. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't even think he had eyes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so just make sure you, that you're writing stuff down as some sort of reference document. Um, we may actually do an episode about that a bit later because I've started using a program which is like totally free and it's been very good for doing this. Um, and yeah, before, like after I finish probably the next book, I'll be able to judge whether it was, it was worthwhile or not. But anyway, um, hope that answers your question, John. 
we didn't go super specific into the the large scale nature of the series, but I think those are some good principles to stick with. Um, another one is uh, from Nisha, who just who asks, "Can you discuss on your podcast writing mute characters or characters with various disabilities in general?" Who wants to kick off here? Okay, um, <laughs> I, I must admit I've never. I've, I've never written a full sort of like character with a uh, sensory disability. Um, it's something that I am very interested to do at some point because I've written multiple, um, you know, sort of characters who for a brief period of time, they might have a, a sense sort of disabled, maybe they, you know, they're in darkness or whatever, which is, it's really, it's a really very different and interesting way to write to have someone who's you know, robbed of one of their senses to try and put yourself in that sort of situation where you're like okay they wouldn't be able to see but what can they infer from from their sense of smell from their hearing from you know all of those sorts of things yeah. um so i mean I, as i say i've never i've never done it as a full character for a longer period of time but i think that it could be a very interesting thing to do but you really have to ground it in the other senses um as for other disabilities I'm I'm very good at you know taking arms off my characters, and uh, the yeah. biggest problem I find is remembering to say like hand instead of hands. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I had that happen in Paternus when one of the characters lost a hand. Yeah. If you're looking for details, I would probably suggest um talking to people. That's what um, I was going to say. I would yeah. do. You know who who sort of you know have first hand experience of uh yeah. you know what you're sort of trying to capture uh you know the more difficult it is it's one thing you know you go okay blind you can close your eyes and wander around your house falling down the stairs and stuff and you know get some idea other stuff can maybe get more tricky um you know it depends on sort of how much detail you're going into or, you know yeah. the main character but yeah we talk yeah. to people yeah if a, a, it, it would depend on if the, if it's a main character who is blind for me I would want to talk to blind people and the character not is not blinded right then. Right. Uh, but is blind. I would want to talk to people or someone who is blind and has been for some time. And if, it, if my character loses their sight and proceeds through the series without sight, I'd want to talk to somebody, try to find somebody just by asking probably on Twitter or Facebook, someone who had had lost their sight um, and get a little, feel for for their experience a couple people um i'm reading actually uh ascendant right now uh by michael r miller and i Just love that a few weeks ago did you uh, yeah. i'm loving it so far really good. um and uh he's uh, the the two main characters here one of them is a blind dragon and um they speak to each other mentally in their heads and um it's uh I don't know how much research he might have done, but it's really wonderful how he brings this this uh, baby blind, baby uh, born blind dragon um, as it matures and grows and how it experiences the world. And uh, it feels very legit to me. And ML Spencer, Dragon Mage, her character has Asperger's, um, uh, the main character, uh, I believe. And um, she has a son. Who has it so she knows um it's very very interesting um and i believe it's asperger's as opposed to straight on autism but um she knows so she she came from a a, a, a position of, of actually knowing a lot about that so and uh, i mean there are a ton of resources uh reddit weirdly can be extremely useful for that, that because somewhere out there someone mm -hmm. has asked you know, what is it like to be born with or without X? Yeah. Somebody who has, yeah. you know, that experience has gone on and basically like spelled it out. So, I mean, Google foo, you know, you research yeah. and then, you know, trying to do your best to put yourself in that place. And with oh. every other, along with every other aspect of characterization from hair color, height, eye color, whatever it is, ultimately like, you do need to consider how it impacts how other characters react to them or whatever, but it is up to you as the author to decide the extent to which you want it to define your character. So you right. can write a story that is about 
someone with red hair and they live in a society where no one else has red hair like the first wheel of time book basically <laughs> um, <laughs> I was waiting for that. yeah you can uh and you can make that a big deal right uh, and maybe it does need to be a big deal because if they are marked as really different from everybody and the society is like not one that is super welcoming of those differences then it kind of makes sense that it would impact the characterization but most of the time when you're reading books and you know there's things like different eye colors between characters it's not a huge thing so when it comes to writing about characters that like might be differently abled or might be you know like blind or having lost a lost a leg or something like that before in a wheelchair in a wheelchair yeah. like you can decide to make that a focus or you can decide that it's just a thing that they have um and it may not be central to their characterization um so yeah you just think about what's best for your story um obviously yeah some things will probably need to be addressed because like a blind dragon it's going to be sort of difficult to just you know go with that without actually considering how that would impact the world when most of the dragons in that world have eyes and they fly also which fairly hard to find impact. somebody with the experience of it on reddit <laughs> yeah i i did struggle All right, are there any dragons out dragon there born <laughs> blind could you give me a little idea of your uh <laughs> yeah what's what's it like being a blind dragon Actually, what's it like being a dragon first? Well, That's especially when it, you know, it's hard too because it becomes sentient very quickly. Mm. Um, unlike a child, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, uh, so you've got to go through those phases really fast. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for that question, Nisha. Uh, last question comes from our high tier patron, Daniel, who asks, what is everyone's view on multiple viewpoints in a book? if they are separated by chapters and labeled. So I guess this can just be sort of a discussion about like, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we sort of treat multiple viewpoints? Like, how do we do it right? What are some pitfalls with it? Um, and yeah, like, how, how do we approach it, I suppose? Uh, Mike, do you, wanna, do you wanna kick off maybe? Uh, so I, I've got a couple of books with multiple POV characters. I've done it a bunch of times. Beyond Redemption has a ton of them. Um, the hard part is trying to figure out if uh, find and capture a voice and perspective for each mm -hmm. of those characters and then remembering what it was. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of critical is, is making them each people. Um, and to me, it's like, before you write the book, this is crazy thinking about things in advance before you write the <laughs> book, you sit down and you say, what do I need to tell this story? And you're like, can I tell the story from one point of view? And if you can, awesome, do that. Because it'll mm -hmm. be super tight, super focused. But if uh, you're in a position where like the City of Sacrifice books, uh, I, I really, I wanted two different points of view uh, so that you could see both sides of the struggle. Um, and, but the only way to do that, you really, you know, you need at least two characters. Beyond Redemption, I was looking for just absolute madness. And so like I did stupid shit, like, you know, like some guard in a tower would get a, you know, super short couple of paragraphs, you know, and that's it. The, you just got this little flash of somebody's yeah. POV, but that was really just sort of world building and using. Well, Abercrombie like, does that. Aber Abercrombie does a lot of that. Like in a battle, he'll, he'll bounce between what, five to seven or eight povs and you that's the first time you've ever been in that person's pov and it's the last time yes you'll ever be in their pov <laughs> well um, he kind of uh that, that's one of the things that he sort of i think he pretty much started within the uh the the, the fancy sort of thing so that's it there's a, there's a few of them series in like heroes um sorry yeah. series like scenes and heroes where you're yeah. literally like you're in one character's point of view and then they're killed and then you're in the person's point of view who killed them and mm -hmm. then you're in there until they get killed. And it's like a sort of domino effect type thing going on. And you're just like different points of view, um, which is really cool. And it's yes. something that, you know, is absolutely yeah. fantastic within the book. Yeah, he um, does it with to great effect in um, a couple of the books in his latest trilogy, too. No spoilers. Haven't read the latest trilogy. Not read them yet. But yeah, so that, that's that's one of the other things you can you can certainly do. You can play with points of view by having minor character points of view all over the place. But um, he separates those just by extra space and the dot 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 or like new, some little thing. New paragraphs, yeah. Basically. In the same in the same chapter, um, I do I do some of that in um, in Paternus, uh, a lot of that in the bigger scenes. Um, I do it when characters are in the same space. 
if they're all on the same battlefield or they're all in the same cave or they're all in the same area, then I'll do it that way. Um, and sometimes it is only a paragraph or two. And sometimes I don't even separate them, but that's what makes Paternus weird. But I do have plenty of just this chapter is this character. These, this chapter is this character. This chapter is this character. And it's exactly what Mike said. It's finding a voice because not only can how they think and what they think about and the way they speak be different, needs to be different from other characters. Otherwise, they all start sounding alike. But it's really effective if you can make the prose change as well. Um, and I've mentioned it before, but M.R. Carey is one of the absolute masters of that. If you want to see one of the best uh, examples of that I have ever read, it's The Girl with All the Gifts. Um, if you want to see how a voice can change so wonderfully from one character's POV and chapter to the next, check that out. Yeah, actually, what are some good books that play with point of view, either in a way that is like really good from a kind of conventional technical perspective or ones that really sort of make you realize the possibilities that that you can do with it so i think the heroes is michael michael's favorite author brandon sanderson um does it <laughs> does it a lot and it, from a technical perspective he mm -hmm. does it really well yeah, yeah really well no complaints it's not artsy yeah. it's not it's not particularly subtle or artistic um but I think even Brandon would admit that. I mean, he calls his, his own writing workmanlike, and it works. It's it's it does exactly what it needs to do, and it does it very very well. Um, whether you particularly like that kind of prose and writing or not, um, it works for an awful lot of people. Mm. Um, but then uh, you know, people like M. R. Carey, I think, take that to a, another whole. A whole whole new level. Uh, Zelazny does that too. Um, Roger Zelazny is just so freaking brilliant at everything he does. Um, a good good one, good one to uh, to look at. Some of his books bounce in uh, in um, different perspectives. I think the the thing for me is trying you know figure out yeah how like Michael said sort of like if you need to have multiple perspectives to tell the story you want to tell then you know do but also like don't be afraid to add more perspectives if you sort of like you suddenly go you know you might be halfway through a story and you're like I'm missing something don't be afraid to add another perspective in there if that's what it needs yeah. to to push the yeah. story along or anything yeah. because to be honest you know once you've got those extra perspectives down it it starts to add extra depth to the story, especially if you're writing something like an epic fantasy. I mean, you can do those from a, a, a you know, soul like first person perspective or just a single perspective. You certainly can. But if you're adding extra perspectives yeah. onto it, it usually adds a sort of greater depth to the world to, to, and just makes it feel larger and more, more lived in. I mean, George Martin is, you know, it's, he does it extremely well. And that's part of what, besides that he goes to so many different characters, um, he does each one, he builds each one is, is a world unto itself, kind of. Um, I think he'd be, I think he's a good example. And another people want to read. Just on that point you were saying, Rob, is like of adding point of views, you know, sort of as you're going through the story, there are like, yeah, no real restrictions with how you want to do the point of view stuff. Like, for example, in the Thunder Heist, like it's one person's point of view the entire story and then just as we sort of get into the last act around the 75 percent mark of the book it kind of expands into i think like four or five other point of views just to give you a sense of scope and to set up the stakes before you point, go into points of view that. jed points then, of view what did i say point five point, point of view. views <laughs> points of view yeah true points of views um and then yeah it goes back into the writers we have to do that at the end so you don't have to necessarily follow, you know, like any sense of rules when it comes to it. Like if you think it's going to benefit your story um, to do some yeah. sort of weird, unconventional structure like that, then go for it. Um, and yeah, a lot of readers seem to appreciate that because they're like, oh, it's so nice to see it through, to see this world through other people's eyes rather than just being through this one person's yeah. eyes. But you also have the benefit of you still know it's that one person's story and it is a cohesive experience for them. So 
Yeah, no exactly. real rules with this. And Paternus is 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 an exception because I do some really weird shit with that, and some people hate well, it. You they don't bow, really have a they point of bounce view. right off of it. You have an on on like omnipresent point of view, really. You're yeah. in everybody's heads all the time. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's just the idea that yeah, if if you need the point of view of a guardsman to help tell the story, if mm. something is happening in your story, and you're like they, this the, this needs to come across to the reader, mm. and I need someone to figure it out and it has to be i don't know some random guardsman in a tower do it yeah yep. but maybe try to to ground that point of view don't, don't just say hey here's this random guardsman in tower and he does thing you know give them a little bit of a, a backstory or something yeah and, the, and the other head. yeah the, another the, the, the thing that i've done care about them but the reader does have to think that this is a person rather than just yes a device and, and and another thing that I've done is I will write a sequence of chapters of things happening and say it's a group of three or four of the main characters who do have their own points of view. Uh, I might write uh, some of those chapters from one of those characters' point of view and then go back and switch it later because I think it would work better. I have done that. Um, no, this, does, this shouldn't be from her character or his character. It should be from this character's point of view the same thing's happening but a different point of view so you have to change not only whose point of view it is but you know adjust the pros and you know the the, the inner thoughts if there are any with the uh, city of sacrifice stuff. books i actually had uh, an entire point of view throughout the entire book uh books uh that i deleted uh, i actually completely <laughs> cut it because yeah. i realized I, I cut it as an experiment at first um and it was sort of a, this opposing third point of view. And when I cut it, it left so much more, so many more questions. Um, the book became a lot more mysterious. It, there was more like, what the fuck is going on? What is this character doing? Because uh -huh. this, this character is clearly important from the other two POVs. Um, but uh, it was Ephra. Cutting Ephra out was like, absolutely just, uh, it clicked. It yeah. improved the book. An entire POV. Which was crazy, but it absolutely awesome. worked. So yeah. no, kind of gotta keep an eye out for stuff like that. Did you then have to like pad some of the other POVs? Yeah. To... yeah. So some of her scenes I ended up rewriting from one of the other characters' point of view. Um, but then because it was from their point of view, you no longer got to sort of hear her internal monologue and stuff. And because she's so pivotal on what's going on, not seeing that, not hearing her, you know, what her thoughts on all this are. Uh sort of really made the whole thing sort of a little more you have skilled her motivations which yeah. just yeah really added and, to sort of like the depth to it and, the and usually usually when pobs are shifted they're the characters it's in a different location right usually you have this character in this location doing this then these characters from this point of view doing this over here um but then martin again will have like the same dinner scene right from and it'll be a whole chapter from one character's point of view and then it'll shift and it either picks up right there or sometimes even overlaps from another character's point of view the same in the same event um and abercrombie will do that to a certain extent but i've also read i can't think of a book but if you guys think of a book where you'll have an event happen from one character's point of view and then it'll start over and the whole event happens from another character's yes. point of view I, can think I can't think book. I can't name a book right now, but I have read that. Well, it's literally the books. start of the Stormlight books. Every single Stormlight book starts with the same scene, but from a different person's point of view each time. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So I don't know. If, have you read like all of the Stormlight books? I know, Rob, you have. Mike, Absolutely you not. Have. Yeah. So <laughs> basically. No, there's too just, many. But it's just it's too big. It's not it's not that I hate it or anything. It's just too big for me to go. There's with. a lot of books. Yeah, but that's a lot, a lot of books. books. But basically how it works is at the start of every book, it's a big like dinner scene at this king's mansion. Um, and this what? is not a spoiler because it happens right Sanderson away. Sanderson doesn't write dinner and tea party scenes with a whole lot of people. <laughs> I, love in I mean, there's um, also an assassination going on during it. So, you know. And there's an assassination yeah. that goes on. But basically like every single person from the series is pretty much there. And every time that you start a new book, you go back and you see that scene from a different perspective. And... I think that's it's really cool because it that's lets a really you, neat idea. Yeah. It lets you understand like 
all I'm more intrigued now machinations that are going on in this yeah. particular scene um and yeah it makes you try to like figure out what are the other things that are happening there at the same time so that's an example of same scene huh lots of different experiences I, of it or it's a, very intriguing as a rule like you got to be very careful doing that within one book <clears throat> Because yeah. it can frustrate yes. the reader to be seeing the same shit over and over again. Yes. Mm-hmm. And always feeling like they got to get step back. And now because they've already read it from somebody's point of view, they kind of already know what's going on. Like it better be fucking interesting. There has to be like an actual good reason that you're going back and showing the same scene over again. Totally agree. Uh, if you don't have a really, really good reason for doing it, never overlap your POVs. Oh yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the Stormlight Archive, each point of view is adding more to the story. It's, I mean, it's not just, it, you're adding more to each character, but you're also adding more to the story. You're revealing more each time of this sort of like central mystery that a lot of it is built around. Mm. Um, and so so each book, it becomes that scene, that that, that it, it's, it's set in the past, but it's a pivotal scene within the world. And in each book, it becomes a little bit clearer as to what actually happened, what went down and, and sort of why and everything. So in that sort of situation, yeah, it's it's it works. It's very good. But you are completely right. Like if, if you're just sort of like showing the same scene from a different character and then a different character and nothing new is happening, yeah, people are going to be like, all right, I get it. I've seen it. Move on. Another thing with point of views is, um, and this is something that I'm going through as I start outlining the next book, which will probably have two point of views that are sort of going back and forth, is ask yourself, whose point of view will be the most interesting one to experience this scene through. So let's say you have a scene where one character is an undercover spy and the other character is just, you know, like going about their regular, regular duties. And the scene is one in which they're talking. Chances are you're probably going to have a more interesting scene if you're doing it from the point of view of that undercover spy, because when you get into the point of view of that person, they have all this added tension and suspense of trying to fool this other one, of trying to, you know, come across natural, of not giving away what they're up to. Whereas the other person, it's just a regular day for them. Um, unless flip that unless your around. plan is to reveal, not reveal that this person is a Correct. spy yet, then of course you want to do the other person's POV. I was just going to get to that. So yeah, it depends yeah. on who is going to experience like the most dramatic change in this scene or who is going to have the most dramatic tension. And then that's probably the person that's going to be interesting to look at. Um, So yeah, just something to keep in mind when you do have multiple point of views to choose from, like try to choose the one who is the most interesting one to experience this scene from. And that may also like, that may not be the person who is doing the main action of the scene. If you have a scene where someone is doing some really cool magic, um, you could do it from their point of view, but it might be more dramatically interesting if you show that from the point of view of someone who is less experienced who doesn't quite understand what's going to happen um, and is more in awe of the event that is unfolding. So yeah, point of view is a really useful tool um, for just sort of guiding your reader's experience through particular scenes in your story. All right. Do we have anything else to add before we wrap up this episode? Uh, No. Other than set your point of view as an entire city. There you go. There's, there's a good one. <laughs> I just, I, I just like to say that Mike needs a haircut. You're getting a little shaggy. <laughs> getting shaggy. No, I like it. Damn, I think it's a good look. Damn hippie. Yeah. I don't know. The, the beard makes it though. The beard makes yeah. it work real good. Yeah. yeah I'm going to grow, I'm going to grow this. going to go long. It's going to nice. be awesome. ZZ yeah. top stop. Yeah. ZZ top or yeah. Something evil wizard <laughs> goatee. Fu Manchu. Yeah, nah, not quite Fu Manchu. I want an evil wizard goatee. Okay, I see that you got a bit of an evil okay. wizard vibe going on there. I think if you had a bit more gray hair in the in the beard, it would give you more there's, of that. There's actually a fair amount in there, but yeah, it's the glasses. Yeah, that's true. Hard <laughs> hard to look evil wizard with the glasses on. <laughs> so, I mean, what you really, I mean, you, you're already in a in a well, you you sort of like do your old death metal type thing, so you're pretty much Saruman already. Um, <laughs> you maybe need a staff. A pointy hat. Hmm. Yeah, not bad. Just use a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> you point the guitar at people and then play death metal riffs and it causes the heroes Sorry. to explode into flames. So like Mad Max cool. then. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody for your listener questions. If you have any other questions you would like us to maybe answer on the show, 
feel free to send those through to wizardswarriorswords at gmail.com. Um, yes. Also, I am currently working on putting up a website for the podcast. So I'm not sure yeah. if it'll be live. I won't give you the link yet because it might not be live by the time this episode goes. Um, but just have a look down in the show notes and see if there is an, a website link down there. And if it is, then I've successfully made the website and you can check it out. Um, and if not, it will be coming at some stage. So I will probably do a short announcement that just goes up independently of an episode where I say, here's the website. Um, let us know what stuff you would like us to include on our website. So at this stage, we're thinking lists of all our books, lists of like the top books that we recommend either these are great examples of how to write fantasy books or these are excellent writing advice books um we're gonna have like a gummies yeah that as well (laughs) um we're gonna have a option on the website where you can send through voice messages to us um which can potentially appear on the episode so instead of me having to read out your questions you'll just be able to do a voice message and um then we'll be able to play that on the episode which will be quite a cool feature i want a voice message of the cat purring along to us yes yes <laughs> that sounds sick <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so just let us know what features you would kind of like on the website can't guarantee they'll all get on there but it'd be good to know what would be interesting to you again just send that through to wizards words at gmail.com thank you everybody for listening or watching and we'll see you next week see ya thanks guys thanks everybody <laughs>